Hello everyone and welcome back to another Fallout 76 event spotlight. Today we're going to cover one of my favorite and one of the most challenging events in the game, Project Paradise. If you like seeing me cover different events, if you like to see how things work, go ahead and subscribe. I publish a lot of Fallout 76 content every week on the channel. If you're subscribed, not only will you never miss any of it, but it also gives me a better idea of what sort of things people like to see. So it's very important, don't forget. With that out of the way, let's get into the event. Project Paradise is a tough one to cover. It's a high level event that really requires a large group of players to follow instructions in order to complete it successfully and get the best rewards. As a result, a lot of players skip it. Maybe they don't have faith that other people will show up or maybe they're afraid that the people who do won't actually be helpful. It's a combination of things. I hope that with a video like this that shows people what to do, everyone will feel more comfortable going to Project Paradise. It should also be noted that when the event first came out and for quite a while afterward, the event was just riddled with bugs. Crashes were common, enemies and items didn't spawn correctly, sometimes the event just didn't complete. In my experience, all of those bugs are fixed now. So if that's been holding you back, you don't have to miss out anymore. The next thing you need to know about Project Paradise are its rewards. There are some good ones that you can get just for completing the event. You don't even have to keep more than one animal alive. Those notable rewards are four treasury notes, an Arctos Pharma backpack plan, and the plan for Formula P, which drastically increases the hip fire accuracy of your guns. If you do manage to keep all the animals alive, then you get a chance at the best stuff. The plan for the bear arm, which you need if you want legendary bear arms to drop from the purveyor, mod plans for the bear arm, and one of the rarest plans in the game, the Stimpak Diffuser recipe. You need to use some Stimpak Diffusers for one of the Pioneer Scout challenges, but the real benefit there is that they're incredibly easy to make and will have you rolling in caps if you sell them in your vending machines. When we open our map and see that the event is active, we'll find it at Arctos Pharma, located in the forest region. Don't let that fool you, it's a dedicated interior area. The enemies are all high level and they put up a hell of a fight. We can see from the brief description on the map that it's recommended for level 50 players and above. At the event, we'll attract friendly creatures to the three habitats and defend them from predators which is a pretty concise explanation. For this event, you always want to be sure to fast travel directly to the event marker on the map. It's a public event, so fast travel is free, and more importantly, it's much faster. If you go to Arctos Pharma and try to use the elevator to access the event, it often takes forever for it to load you in. I've seen people stuck in loading screens in that elevator for several minutes at a time. Avoid that by just going directly to the event. As we transition to the event, the loading screen gives us more detailed information about it. Project Paradise. Take part in a long-lost experiment in the Arctos Pharma Biome Lab, and you may make some unexpected new friends. Collect the preferred food in each habitat and deposit it into the feeder. That's the biggest thing we're going to cover in this video. Second, the more food supplied, the tougher the creature it will attract. That's key. You need a tough creature because they're easier to defend. Number three, protect the friendly creatures from predators as the number of survivors determines your reward. This is really what it's all about. We want to attract them, get the toughest creature possible, and defend them as efficiently as possible. After you load in, you'll see a timer in the top right corner if the event isn't already underway, and a quest marker directing you to initialize the experiment. If you don't initialize it before that timer runs out, the event will just automatically fail. In this case, I had less than two minutes to start the event, so I had to be quick about it. I only had time to take out a couple of immediate threats and then rush to the computer to start the event. Under ideal circumstances, you'll have nearly 10 minutes left on the clock and can take some time to get the lay of the land and take out the various ghoul and robot threats around the lab. It also means that there's a chance that more people will show up before time runs out. This is an incredibly important thing to understand. You have to initialize the experiment before the timer runs out, but not necessarily immediately. If you can put yourself in front of the computer and wait until there's about a minute or so left on the timer, 
that's ideal. If other players can see that someone else is at the event, which the map icon will tell them, they're more likely to show up. What you don't want to do, unless you and your friends are all geared up and know exactly what they're doing, is rush to the computer and start the event early. There are three events in Fallout 76 with timers like this, Project Paradise, Encrypted, and Radiation Rumble. These are all tough events where having as many people as possible increases your chances of success. Always, always, always let those timers go as long as possible before starting those events. Sometimes you'll see somebody else try to access the computer to start the event before they really should. It's usually newer or lower level players who probably haven't been here before. They're just following the instructions on the screen, so you can't blame them for thinking it's the right thing to do. Do your best to communicate what's happening. Let them know you're going to start the event at the one minute mark and that you're just waiting for other people to show up. It's often hard to tell if other players can actually hear what you're saying because so many people turn off voice chat that it's just impossible to know unless they talk back, which for some reason is an incredibly rare occurrence in Fallout 76. It can seem a bit rude because we don't really have any polite emotes, but make sure to throw out some no or thumbs down emotes if they're getting close to the computer, just in case they can't hear you. Usually they'll get the picture. This can feel a little frustrating at times, but you know what? Credit to all those newbies who are excited to just jump in. At least they're showing some initiative. After we wait out the clock and hopefully some other players show up, we can go into the computer and choose the option to initialize the experiment. Project Paradise is now in progress. Phase one, attraction of test subjects. Feeding troughs in habitat A, B, and C are currently empty. Replenish the feeding troughs with organic materials. Do proceed with caution. Our beastly friends are not inclined to wait patiently for dinner. After starting the experiment, we can immediately run to the biome lab of our choice and get to work, or take an additional optional step. We can change the experiment to make it test Formula Q instead of Formula P. To do that, after initializing the experiment, you can proceed west into a corridor behind the computer. Here, you'll kill a couple of ghouls and find a keypad controlled door. To access it, you'll need to know the code. You can find the code fragments hidden all around the Arctos Pharma Biome Labs, or you can just copy it down now. The code is 970-930. Once you make your way down into this secret lab, you'll want to watch out for robots and ghouls as you proceed east and jump down one more level. Here, you'll find another door, and after you enter it, you can turn to your left, you'll see another terminal. Take care of any immediate threats so they don't jump you while you're logging in. Then go into the terminal and look for an entry titled Shutdown Code. Once you read the entry, the shutdown code will be added to your inventory. Now you'll want to make your way back upstairs to the terminal where you initialized the experiment. There's still a number of threats on your way out. Just hit the button to open the door again and make your way back to that original terminal. When you get there, just look for an entry titled Shutdown, and you'll hear a new voice come over the PA system. Hello, everyone. Someone here shut down the bad computer, so they're the now. The animals come out to play nice. Make sure they know how good they are. Of course, this sounds all sweet and wholesome, but the reality is that changing the experiment probably doesn't work out in your or the animal's favor. In my experience, doing this doesn't change the rewards you'll have access to, but it might increase the odds for the really rare stuff with a perfect finish. It's impossible for me to know, I just haven't ever seen the event finish perfectly enough times to really gather the data. The change has two and possibly three effects on the event. First, it will cause all of your friendly animals to regenerate health in between the three waves of enemies you need to defend them from. That's quite useful, but they have to be alive in order to regenerate health. And that's the hard part, because the second thing this change does is that it makes your friendly animals incredibly aggressive. Instead of running and hiding from threats, they'll charge in and attack them. This often leads to those animals getting themselves killed before the first wave of enemies is even complete. 
The third thing that can happen is that some or all of your friendly animals can spawn as legendary, allowing them to mutate and regenerate health if they get taken down to their halfway point. Sadly, this doesn't happen every time, and even when it does, they often get mobbed and killed anyway. In short, unless you really just want to do everything for the sake of doing everything, I wouldn't recommend changing the experiment. Just leave it alone and complete it normally. Perhaps one day we'll learn that there are specific rewards for completing it with Formula Q, but until then, it's probably not worth the trouble. Now that that's all out of the way, let's look at what exactly you need to do in each biome lab to fully stock your feeding troughs and attract the strongest friendly animal possible. We'll also talk about what type of build is best equipped for each biome lab. After the experiment is initialized, you'll want to run to one of the three biome labs in the area. We'll start with biome A to the north of the computer. Remember, if you're not the one initializing the computer, you should go to your chosen lab ahead of time, clear out any threats, and wait there for the event to begin. When we make our way into biome A, we're going to see a variety of enemies, anything from robots to wolves to Yao Guai. But most importantly, we're going to see what are called sickly radstags. They're albino radstags that we need to kill and loot for venison. So you want to keep an eye out for your enemies as you go, kill as many of these sickly radstags as possible, and collect the fragrant venison from their corpses. The goal with all of these labs is to collect 60 pieces of the appropriate material. Once you have some, go up to the feeding trough and click to deposit it. You want to make sure that you're depositing as you go. These areas are tough, even for seasoned players. It's very common to die unexpectedly. And the last thing you want to do is die while you're holding 30 pieces of the item you need to stock and then not be able to respawn in time to put them into the trough. That's going to let down all the other players at the event and disappoint you quite a bit. So here we go. We'll just continue to uh, collect our venison. And as we go here, it's easy to get comfortable. It's easy to forget what's what's hanging around. But we've got a lot of tough enemies that show up. So always be on the lookout here. It's really easy to get taken by surprise. Even a cave cricket can take you down if you're a low health build. Now, Biome A is the most popular one for players to do because, honestly, it's probably the easiest of all the biomes. Even low-level players can usually take down the Radstags pretty easily, so they can be useful here. But really, this is the lab that you want to send your bloodied players to, your bloodied ranged players. So if you're a bloodied stealth commando or rifleman or heavy gunner, this is probably the place for you. There's big tanky enemies in here, but at the same time, they can easily be taken out from range and there's no damage over time. There's no poison or acid or fire in here to worry about. So you can just efficiently kill things and collect the items you need to collect. In this lab, you will see legendary enemies. There'll be legendary rad stags. We saw a legendary sentry bot when we came in. That's one of the benefits to this event is there are legendaries everywhere. Even if you don't complete the event successfully, between the random legendaries that show up, the high XP from the high level enemies in the area, and the good loot that they drop. Here, you've got honey beasts dropping stim packs and adhesive. You've got Yao Guais dropping springs and acid. You've got cave crickets dropping acid. Lots of meat to pick up. This is a good event to do. So even if you don't think you can succeed, show up, do the event, you're going to get something out of it. Now, I won't make you sit here while I collect 60 pieces of fragrant venison. Let's go ahead and move on to see what we need to do in Biome B. To access Biome B, we'll want to run southeast from the terminal. This Biome Lab is by far the toughest and most frustrating. If you're playing solo, avoid this one. If you have a group, this is the one for your tankiest melee and shotgun players to run. There's a ton of rads and dozens of mole rats flying at your head while you're trying to collect toxic sludge for the feeding trough. You'll see the toxic sludge in glowing, steaming piles all over the habitat. But it also drops from mole rats 
not every mole rat, but from a lot of them. You'll want to run around collecting as much as you can, killing and looting as many mole rat corpses as possible, and regularly depositing your sludge into the feeding trough. Remember, the goal is to get to 60. I don't think I've ever seen it get past 40, but do your best. The reason this habitat is best for tanky melee and shotgun players is because they can take a lot of hits and need to be up close and personal with enemies anyway. Here, the enemies deliver themselves right to you. Honestly, the area is incredibly frustrating. The noise from the mole rats exploding out of the ground and water is obnoxious, but somebody's got to do it, so it might as well be the player best built for it. Now that we know what to do in Habitat B, let's take a look at C, the third and final biome lab. The quickest way to get to Habitat C is to run north from the terminal all the way through Habitat A, where you'll see that it directly connects to Biome C. Once inside, the goal is to collect as much moist rad kelp as possible. As with the others, the goal is 60, and deposit it into the feeding trough. You'll see the rad kelp on the ground all over the habitat with orange glowing steam coming off of it. The enemies in every habitat are tough, make no mistake about it. But this area probably has the most forgiving enemies for underleveled players or players with non-optimized builds. You'll see anglers, blood bugs, and various mire lurks, many that use damage over time attacks like poison and fire. This place is not very welcoming for low health builds. It's still better than Habitat B if you're bloodied, but not by much. At least it isn't as nerve wracking. A good strategy here is to have one or two players watching out for and killing enemies, while another just runs around picking up rad kelp. This is a great strategy if you're escorting a lower level player through the event. With this biome, you need to keep your eyes open and grab all the rad kelp as quickly as possible. It doesn't always spawn fast enough for you to get to 60, but it can happen. Just make sure you're grabbing up every bit of it you can and depositing it regularly. Remember, you don't want to die while you're holding a horde of rad kelp and miss the deposit cutoff. One thing that often happens at Project Paradise is that players will all congregate in one area. You want to avoid that. If you go to your preferred habitat or the one that fits your build best, but there's already two or three players in it, just go ahead and move on to the next one. Even if you can't fill your feeding trough all the way, there are three tiers of friendly creatures. Even a tier one creature is better than a tier zero, and you just don't need eight players all collecting food in one biome lab. You can only get to tier three, so even if you manage to get 80, 90, or 100 pieces of food in the trough, it doesn't matter past 60. So go ahead, move on to the next area, and try and improve your chances by getting stronger animals in the other ones. Now that we've filled our feeding troughs, it's time to defend our friendly animals. Each area attracts different creatures. In Habitat C, you'll see increasingly strong mire lurks. In B, you can get a feral ghoul, a snallygaster, or a mega sloth if you fill the trough completely. It could be argued that in B, you're better off stopping at 40, as the snallygaster is probably tougher to kill than the mega sloth. In Habitat A, you get a glowing wolf, a yaogwai, or a deathclaw if you make it all the way to 60. In any of the biome labs, if you don't get at least 20 pieces of food into the trough, you'll get a tier zero friendly creature, which is usually a pitiful bug of some sort that will typically die almost instantly. While I'd love to show you what it looks like to defend every type of creature, that's just not very time efficient and it's pretty much impossible. Project Paradise just doesn't pop enough to get that variety of footage. In this case, we'll defend the Deathclaw from Biome A. The first thing you probably notice here is that your friendly animal doesn't always stay where they're supposed to. Just because they spawn in one biome doesn't mean they're going to stay there. They will do the loop and run through all the different habitats, get themselves in all sorts of trouble, and it's on you and your teammates, if you have any, to follow them around and make sure they stay safe. Don't be surprised to see them get stuck in weird areas. Don't be surprised to see them get attacked by ghouls and robots. Any number of things can happen. You just have to stay with them and keep them safe. Now at this point, you're looking at this and wondering, Fisty, 
Why are you tormenting this poor friendly animal that isn't attacking you? Well, here's why. I have a shish kebab and the friendly fire perk equipped. By equipping that perk card, I can hit any friendly creature or teammate with that weapon and heal them. This can be a huge help in this event, and it works at others too. You can use it to heal the Brahmin during free range and riding shotgun, or the NPCs during radiation rumble. It's a bit slow and sometimes doesn't seem to heal to 100%, but it's very helpful to have, especially if you're doing the event alone and can't avoid some damage to your friendly creature. Sometimes you run into situations like this one, where your friendly animal has found their way into a relatively safe area and the enemy waves can't seem to find their way toward them. In this situation, you can either wait for them to come or go hunt them down. We'll give it a couple of seconds here and, and see if anything shows up, but uh, I have a feeling I'm going to have to go hunting for the next wave. So yeah, he looks like he's doing a little bit of window shopping there. It's a tough call here because you've got plenty of time, so there's something to be said for just staying with your animal, maybe making a little bit of noise and seeing if that draws something your way. But if it doesn't, at some point, you've got to make a move. And that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go ahead and head into A, because that's where that wave is going to spawn. Now, I can't see my creature, but I can keep an eye on their health bar in the top right. So if I see that something is coming after him, I'm going to have to haul ass back over there and take care of business. But for now, it looks like all of our hostiles are pretty safely in the habitat. So we'll go ahead and, and clear out whatever we can, keep an eye on that health bar. We're in caution, so there's other things around. So far, so good. We've got some honey beasts here. Nothing too intimidating. You'll usually see a couple of bears. There we go. Make sure you grab that acid. That's super helpful for your ammo crafting. And you'll notice too, I'm using berry mentats here. It makes it a little easier to spot things. So now, after two waves of enemies, we're now going to get our Alpha Predator. In this case, where we're doing Biome A, that's going to be an Alpha Sheep Squatch. Now here, we go back out, we look after our Deathclaw, and he's being attacked again. So we're going to want to take care of those threats and see if we have a little bit of time to heal him back up. In this case, he's the only friendly creature left alive. And when that happens, you know for a fact that your alpha is going to spawn in that biome. And we're getting attacked again, so we're going to have to take care of that. This is why this event is tough. You just, you never know when things are going to come out. Sometimes spawns are late or unpredictable. And now we know the alpha predator has already spawned. But not where our creature is. So I'm following him around. I'm going to protect him for a little while and make sure everything's okay before I head back to A and take out the Sheep Squatch. Typically, if your creature is in anything other than their home habitat, the other habitats will not spawn new waves of hostile enemies once the creature, the friendly creatures from those habitats are dead. So you should be safe here but there might still be some things lingering around. So now that he's healed up and this habitat looks clear, I'm going to go run back into A, take one last look there. We're going to head in here and we're going to take out that Sheep Squatch. This is easier said than done with a solo player. So you want to make sure your damage output is as high as possible. Take some Psycho if you can. Uh, once adrenaline is fixed, make sure you pump that up. I had that working when I recorded this. And there's our Sheep Squatch. Now, the nice thing here is because I'm here alone and I did not repair the turret in the room, the Sheep Squatch is not aggroed to anything. So as long as I'm in caution, my sneak attack criticals count so he's relatively easy to kill. 
if the turret is turned on or there are other players around or other creatures around attacking it, then it becomes a lot harder. So we got away with it this time. Now, in the other areas, you can get other alpha enemies. For example, in Biome B, you can get yourself a Grafton monster. While in Biome C, you'll get an alpha fog crawler. Sadly, I wasn't able to get footage of the fog crawler. I ran the event dozens of times over the last couple of months trying to get footage for this video and just never had one finish with the fog crawler. At some point, you just have to move forward. So take my word for it, the boss for Biome C is a fog crawler. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the video. I really hope that this helps shed some light on what you need to do during Project Paradise. It's a great event with great rewards in a beautifully designed area. It's even filled with lore for those who want to explore it. Honestly, it pains me to see that so few people show up for this one. Hopefully, as more people learn how it works, that'll change. As always, if you enjoyed this video, found it helpful, or anything in between, be sure to like, share it with your friends, and most importantly, subscribe so you don't miss any of the videos I publish every week on the channel. Until next time, I'm Fisty McRib.